Now there was a path that went like this. And that had a time so. It's all also too short, not as much as the other one. We have to make it take a little longer, so we have to put a piece of glass in here. This glass is not as thick as this one because we don't have so much to offset. The nearer we get to the top, the less we have to use glass to slow it up. And the very last one needs no glass at all. If you put all these funny pieces of glass in there, the net result, of course, is that you're putting in a piece of glass shaped like so. The result of that is that the time now, with the glass in, by careful design and the exactly right shape and right thickness, you just found out how to calculate the thickness exactly, just put the right thickness in to compensate the time, you will find that the times now are all the same, no matter which path it is of these straight line types. What happens then? Now, each one of them contributes its amplitude. Yes, amplitude, same time, same, whatever the angle of one of them is, the next one's the same, next one's the same. You yeah, straightened out the arrows. Ah, <laughs> what a dirty trick. You straightened out the arrows. And there's a lot of arrows. There's millions of arrows. And so the result of this is how they get, for the final result from the front to the tail, a sensationally large, unexpectedly enormous arrow. A high probability of going. Of course, you know what I'm describing. A focusing lens. If you have a source of light here, and it just sends light to here, it's kind of weak because it spreads. But if you put a lens here, it'll concentrate it right away again back to here. And that means concentrated light means high intensity, and really high intensity means lots of photons. Or if the light was weak, the chance of a photon arriving is very strong at this particular point and very small everywhere else. And so by the trick of arranging things so that times are equal, we focus light. And so by this, I use these examples to show you how what looks at first like an absurd rule with no causality and nothing like anything real produces effects that you're more used to. It also produces other effects that you may not have been used to, such as the grading and a number of other things. And so this is uh, the success of this point of view, and it continues to be successful. And I would summarize it by saying what we know so far is that the probability is equal to the square of an amplitude, then they need a calculus of the amplitude, and an amplitude for an event that can happen in several different ways. In different ways, I should have written this in the beginning, is the sum of an amplitude for each way. Now I have uh, the rest of the, that should be really all that is, is really necessary to understand. But in order to get a full flavor of the theory, I would like to tell you a little bit more about how people calculate these amplitudes. And uh, a little bit more about the law for the amplitude. For example, I kept bringing in funny things like, uh, from when you have a reflection, you have a little arrow. When it's from the other surface, you make the arrow backward. Uh, when you go through glass, you have to use a faster timing, and so forth. All, right? All these things should have to be explained, and they will be, not this lecture. However, the particular feature that I can describe a little better, a few things of how we analyze the amplitude. A particular problem to show you the type of thing is this. Suppose you had a surface here, and that we have a reflection. Suppose this was a 4% surface. So that the amplitude, the intensity that came out here was 1 25th, or that for that surface, the amplitude of reflection is a fifth. Now that, it, and I put the photocell here. Well, you could put a double surface. Well, I have it already drawn. I'll draw it again. I have a double surface, and a source, and a reflections, and all this stuff, and I computed the amplitude for the light to arrive here. Now I'm going to try another thing. Instead, of putting the photomultiplier there, and make a little hole, I let the light keep going, and I let it bounce to a couple of other surfaces, three surfaces, whatever it is, all right, and come out over here and put the photomultiplier there. How do I figure out what happens, what the amplitude is? Now, this amplitude in this particular thing can be thought of in, as, so to speak, two problems. One, if light starts here, What's the amplitude to get here? 
The second, another problem that's interesting is if I put the source here directly, what would have the amplitude to have been got there been? It turns out from the, you know those two things, you can figure out this combined problem by an operation you could call the rule for successive amplitudes. Right? The rule goes like this. Let us suppose that this section here, if you don't understand this too well, it doesn't make any difference. You get some, I'm trying to give you some flavor. The flavor tastes bad. It is, just relax. Now, here, some people like ginger snaps and some might don't. Let's say this problem, we've already worked out the amplitude for all the possibilities added together to arrive here. Let's call this point A, this point B, and this point C. So we have if, or the amplitude to B, to get the B from A, that is a source A of unit strength, one photon, has an amplitude to get the B that's been worked out. Let's suppose we start out, this is the source strength, one unit. We begin. And what do we get out is the result B, the amplitude comes out some crazy arrow. So let's say that that thing is this arrow. That's the amplitude that gets to from B to A with the source. What is this thing? It's one-fifth as long. Let's say it was one surface. It's one-fifth as long and a certain timing. Let's suppose this surface over here ends up as a four percent, uh, a one-sixteenth reflector. Or nine, nine. 11% and one ninth reflect makes it easy for me. The length of this thing is a fifth, you see, so that the thing will be 25, 1 25th, and you have to turn it to an angle. Now this next one, if it would work all by itself, if the amplitude to get to C from B alone is this, if at B there was a unit amplitude, if at B it really were one, then there's a certain time delay and the reflection. There's some time delay corresponding to some angle, and there's a length of one-third. This happens to do with the time delay. The time delay, I mean, from B to C. Now, what would the result be? Why do I say a third? Because the area of the square would be one-ninth, which is what I said the reflection should be. Now, what will be the amplitude to go to go get to C? from B, from A, all the way. It isn't hard to guess. First of all, the total time means that the angle, whatever it is, you go around and around and around, the sum of the amount you went around for the first part plus the second part, because the total time is the sum of the two times. So that you're going to draw something whose angle is the sum of this one and this one. It would have turned around while it was going to B, just goes around and around and around and around, it goes to B, and it goes around and around and around and some more, and that's how much more. So the net result is an arrow sum like this at, at an angle, which is the sum of that angle and this one. You turn this, and then you turn it that much more, and you come to here. Here's where we start with the one, and here's what we're coming out with. And how long should it be? Well, the chance that it gets, of all the light that comes down here, 1 25th is reflected here. And of all the light photons that come here, only 1 9th is reflected there. So it turns out that that means that the total of a... Uh, of the light, let's say I had a, a thousand, uh, well, I don't know if I have bad numbers. I should have taken better numbers. What, what you have when you finish is one twenty-fifth times one ninth of the light, one over 225 parts out of 225 photons, about, on the average, one twenty-fifth or nine photons get through here, and of those, one goes here. So one out of 225 come out, which is, by the way, one fifteenth times one fifteenth. Fifteenth. So therefore, this size of this is one fifteenth. Now, the one fifteenth can be that if it's this composition, this is the rule of composition. Add the angles and multiply the length. So you have two events in succession. You combine them by this rule of composition that you add the angles and multiply the length. Putting an arrow on the tail of another arrow to find a final arrow, we call adding the amplitudes. Composing them this way, multiplying their lengths and adding the angles, we call multiplying the amplitudes. The reason we call it multiplying is interesting, therefore, that arrows can be added, can be combined by two operations, 
putting them on each other's tail and multiplying them together like this, which we have called adding and multiplying. And the reason we call it adding and multiplying is it obeys all the right rules of arithmetic for addition and multiplication. All of the rules such as, uh, oh, I don't remember the rules. A times B is the same as B times A, for instance. So A and B are these arrows, combining it this way and meaning by times this composition rule, then it continues to be right. Now, the rules of algebra are things that are studied by mathematicians. And mathematicians have tried to find all the common, all the objects that you could possibly find which obey those rules. The rules were originally made for counting apples. It was improved by using negative numbers. It was improved still further by inventing fractions. It's still true you can add and multiply fractions. You can use unending decimals to represent numbers and add them and multiply. We have today become very sophisticated. In the early days when mathematics was first developing, and it was said that a number is something like when you count the number of apples or people or something like that, then the whole idea of a half a person was a, a problem. But today there's no difficulty at all, and nobody has any moral or discomforting, gory feeling when they hear that there are 3.2 people per square mile in certain regions. <laughs> it doesn't bother them. They don't try to imagine the 0.2 people. But what they do is they know what they mean, that if they multiply that by 5, it gets to be 16, and so forth. And so some things that can satisfy the rules of arithmetic can be interesting to mathematicians, even though they're not represented by numbers of apples absolutely, and they're without having a picture exactly what it is. And these arrows on a plane, which can be combined by two operations, tying them on each other's tail, and combining them by this multiplying and adding angle business, those two rules, adding and multiplying, obey the same rules as uh, algebra, and these amplitudes are in fact called some kind of numbers by mathematicians, and to distinguish them from ordinary numbers, they call them complex numbers. Makes it hard, in other words. So, <laughs> so if, uh, for those who have studied four years of university, or enough algebra to have come to complex numbers, I could have said all this by simply saying uh, amplitude, the probability is the square of a complex, absolute square of a complex number, the amplitude is a complex number, I mean, and the probability is it's square, and that when they think it happen in more than one way, you add the complex numbers, and when it happens in uh, succession, you multiply the complex numbers. And have I said any more than I did before? No. It's just a different language, and it may be sound better, and the only reason I use that different language is because some few of you have may have heard of that language, and it would be nice to make sure, I just wanted to make sure to you that it was uh, really the same thing. For those who have never heard of it before, the idea that that is multiplication may be disturbing, and I think I waste a little time on the side of nothing to do with, well, I think I waste time. I'm late, so I shouldn't waste time. I wanted to explain why it's reasonable. I can't resist. <laughs> I want to explain why that is uh, a reasonable way to define multiplication. This is a stupid thing. It has nothing to do with our lecture. I call it multiplication, but that's enough, but I have to play anyway. What is multiplication? And the Greeks used numbers, wanted to use numbers that were not necessarily integers, and they did it by talking about line. If this is a unit, then the line, this length, represented the number one. Whereas a number like two would be represented by a line, which would be twice as long. That way you can represent fractions and so forth, a third as long, two and a half times as long, so forth. So here's one. Two is the relation 